Professor Sarusi is finished. Um, I'm Laura Wilson. I'm the library director at the Plow Library here in Cincinnati. There are a few people who aren't family, so I thought I should say that. And I want to thank everyone for coming to today's Lunch and Learn presentation. It is part of the Library's Feld Memorial Lecture Series. Today we'll hear Dr. Edwin Sarusi speaking on the folk song of Ladino between tradition and modernity, in which he will trace the present state of research in the field through the study of one song. Dr. Sarusi, professor and the director of the Jewish Music Research Center at the Hebrew University, has written numerous books and articles on Jewish music and is an acknowledged expert in the field. In 2018, he was awarded the Israel Prize, and to paraphrase the words of the committee, given in recognition of his pioneering contributions to the research of the musical cultures of the Mediterranean and the Middle East, Jewish musical traditions, interactions between Jewish and Islamic cultures, and popular music in Israel. This is not Professor Sarusi's first visit to Cincinnati, and hopefully not his last. He and Professor Israel Adler first studied the Edward Birnbaum Music Collection in 1979, and Right now, he is avidly examining a newly rediscovered collection of Israel Adler's correspondence. He was actually working on it as I was writing the introduction. So we want to welcome him today and look forward to his presentation. And I want to remind everyone to please put your cell phones on silent or turn them off. And last, I invite everyone to make time to come to the library. We have a beautiful exhibit on the Edward Birnbaum Music Collection. It is actually interactive, so bring your smart devices with you with QR codes that you can scan and listen to part of the music. And now, Professor Thank you very much, Laura, for this kind presentation. Uh, I feel embarrassed. You want to eat and talk, and here I come to disturb. <laughs> uh, I hope it won't be too much of a burden. I also change a little bit the presentation to make it more marketable and <laughs> less academic. Uh, but basically, I will go straight to the to the point and uh, tell you that the song in Ladino and Judeo Spanish. Uh, still enjoys a tremendous popularity. And uh, this popularity is, uh, I would say, global. And it always fascinates me, because the community that maintained this musical tradition in its natural uh, ecology, I may say, social ecology, cultural ecology, basically doesn't exist anymore. You would be surprised, but it doesn't exist. Uh, so what are the mechanisms that keep these songs alive? And uh, since we don't have a lot of time for theory, I thought I would just present you a little case study, and then I will be open to any questions you have regarding uh, the song in Ladino in general, Sephardi culture, more general Jewish culture, musical culture, I will be uh, glad uh, to follow up on this uh, teaser. So, uh, I will uh, just open with a video. So, one of uh, our research tools today in uh, music is called YouTube. <laughs> now, I'm mentioning this because when YouTube appeared, there was a very uh, wide discussion among uh, music scholars, particularly my field of ethnomusicology. I'm sorry about the feedback, but I'm trying to find the. Perhaps if I speak from here, can you, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the, the, method, the methodological problems of using a type of material that basically you don't know where it comes from or who is the originator presented certain ethic issues. Today it is widely accepted to use these materials uh, provided that you can contextualize them in uh, close, if I speak close it will be enough. 
Okay? Okay, so uh, I repeat that using these uh, materials is allowed, provided that you can uh, find the sources to, uh, to justify the uh, use of, of, this, um, of this material. So this is a videotape from the Spanish TV uh, around uh, uh, 1975. Now, if you know a little bit of the history of Spain, you know that this is a very crucial period. This is the very end of the Franco era, of the dictatorship. And uh, I was wondering, what is a Sephardic song being performed? You will see how the performers look, so you will laugh a little bit, because it's very funny uh, the way they look. Uh, they look like a very famous American ensemble. Let's see if you can guess singing this song. Now, this song, which is the object of this short presentation, is uh, one of the two or three best-known uh, songs in Ladino. I hope that many of you know it and will recognize it, because if not, my whole hypothesis goes down the drain. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. <laughs> I'm sorry I have to interrupt this example simply because we don't have enough time to listen to all of them. But I can send you all the links and you can find them. By the way, when you research with YouTube, and if you can download the videos, this video disappeared from YouTube. So I only have one, my own copy. Uh, so basically, we have here Spanish, uh, a young Spanish uh, artist. None of them is Jewish. Uh, in Spain at this period, uh, still, the Jewish community that exists is a very small one in Madrid, and it's a sort of a tolerated, because technically the Jews are still uh, banned from Spain. So my questions are, why are these people performing these songs? What are their sources? Where did they learn the song from? What are the venues of transmission? These are the issues that really interest me to uh, unveil the network, the social network, that makes possible such a performance. So, um, you know, I can, I can talk very loud. And I, hate, I hate microphones. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me there in the back? Yeah. I can speak very loud. OK, good. Thank you. So here we have the song. I will explain to you this, uh, uh, what is the, the content of the song, uh, the text, and then we will move into several, uh, several sources that put this song into the context of general folklore in Europe. Not only Sephardic, not only Judeo-Spanish, but also in general. Uh, context. So this is one of the oldest versions that we have. It was collected by this man that you see on the side, this uh, very nice fellow. His name is Alberto Kenzi. You're going to have to eat my You cannot, you cannot hear that? No, I think it's just the way you're using it a minute ago. Really? Yeah. Okay. 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 I'm sorry. Uh, so Alberto Kenzi 
the man you see here, he was a very important Jewish uh, composer and a collector of songs. He was born in Turkey, educated in Italy uh, in, uh, in the 1910s. He returned to Turkey uh, and he became an avid collector of the songs of his own family, first of all. His first uh, uh, informants were his, uh, his uh, mother and his uh, uh, auntie, and he recorded the, the songs. The songs were uh, preserved and they reached the Hebrew University and we published them post-mortem after he died in 1985. So he recorded one of the best preserved versions of the song. Basically what we have here is the following. We have a lady and we have a lad, uh, uh, if you want, uh, a young man, uh, probably a caballero in Spanish, uh, how do you say it? Cowboy. Not a cowboy. <laughs> not a cowboy, but uh, never mind. He's he is, he's, the song starts, we don't know who is talking to whom, but obviously it's a man talking to a woman because he says, Abris Megalanica, open my beautiful one or my, my, my nice one, uh, that it's about, uh, the sun is about to come up. So we know the timing of this situation. We know that he's asking her to make an opening to his advances, as I might say. In one line, you already get the picture. So she answers, I will open immediately, my love, my beloved, okay? I cannot sleep at night thinking about you. That's uh, obviously uh, a very uh, common love scene. But he insists, open me the door. And then you realize that she doesn't want to open. And she starts to find excuses. This is why we call the song Todos Son Inconvenientes. Everything is inconvenience. So she starts, Mi padre está meldando. Meldando is a very old word in Latino, not in Spanish. My father is studying Torah. Okay? He will hear our voices. So to every inconvenience, he, reply, she re, uh, he replies with uh, uh, some sort of counseling. So why don't you turn off his, uh, uh, his light? Perhaps he will go to sleep. And then the song continues. Serially, every stanza has the same form. He says, uh, open the door, and she says, my mother is uh, suing. He said, to take uh, her, uh, uh, her needle. Uh, and then she said, my brother is writing, turn his light, my, my sister is doing this. My, so the whole, the whole mishpoche, in the middle of the night, at 4 o'clock in the morning, they're all working. So do we believe her or not? Is she trying to postpone the encounter, the, the, the love encounter? There are here many topics that go to medieval uh, poetry of, uh, of uh, chevaliers. Uh, and, uh, of course, it has a very heavy sexual content there once you read it in its, uh, in its uh, deepness. So this is one of the uh, most uh, famous songs in, uh, um, in uh, Ladin. Now, what is interesting is that this pattern, this model of the song, it's not unique to the Sephardic Jews. So among other things, we found a, a Russian folk song called Anastasia. And you can see here I translated into English for you from the French translation of the Russian translation, <laughs> uh, published in 1888. So we know that in 1888, uh, the, the person who published, he says, it's a very uh, 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 vif, it's a very lively melody, okay? And it's sung by gypsies. So gypsies sing this song, and they sing Anastasia, open your door, accept this poor man, it will be open with pleasure, but my father is still asleep. Almost the same words. Then you start wondering, is this Sephardic song like you will find in relation to this song that is from medieval Spain, or is it a new adaptation? 
And what I want to tell you from my research is that most of the most beloved Judeo-Spanish Sephardic songs are new songs, but they are all presented as if they were from before 1492. So my uh, other questions therefore refer to much larger issues of the imagination that we have about a certain culture, how we build up this, what I call, aura of antiquity, when basically the culture tell us that is much more dynamic and changing and akin to the cultures of the surrounding area than being fossilized and kept uh, as they were 500 years ago. So this is the bottom line. And the fact that the gypsies sing this song is uh, extremely interesting. By the way, the, uh, the publication of this Russian version comes with this picture that illuminates the, the song itself. So you can see the chevalier here uh, trying to ask the lady to open the door. Now, we will see what, in what context this song is performed among the Sephardic Jews, because the context ha has a lot to do with the, the context of performance in the original communities has to do with the content of the song, the opening of the door. Now, we don't have to go too far to find more uh, parallels to this song. Here, Mr. Kahan, in a very famous book of Yiddish songs, 1912, published in New York. Was klappt das als euch pet by now? What are you making so much noise at night? Here I translated this, okay? What is, who, uh, you know, who is knocking uh, so late by night? Jankele Voljacni. Open up, open up, Bronchele. It's your sweetheart. How can I open for you, my daughter? I'm afraid of my mother. Open up, Bronchele. I won't stay very long, and so on and so on. And Yiddish folk song considered the very old Yiddish folk song. So what we have here is a European formula, okay, of a song of a man trying to ask the beloved to open the door in the middle of the night. Then all the rest are variants. The inconveniences are variants, the different the answers are variants, different, but the song has one structure that is found throughout all the versions in the different cultures. It's a serial song. That is to say, every strophe, every stanza has exactly the same form, just the subject changes. Back to Spain. So when does, I'm going back now to my first video, when starts the interest on Sephardic culture among non-Jews in Spain? Remember, the Jews, by royal decree, are out of Spain in 1492, and this decree will be canceled only in 1992, in, 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 in technical terms. So this brings us to a series of people that are very important in Spain. This man is one of the most revered uh, intellectuals in Spanish history, Don Ramon Menéndez Pilal. He is the father of modern uh, Spanish language and literature research. And among uh, his interests from the very beginning is Sephardic culture. Why would this Christian intellectual coming from the hard core of Spanish nobility be interested on the Jews towards the end of the 19th century. And this has to do with internal processes in Spain. This has to do with the sinking of the Spanish Empire in the late 19th century out of its greatness. The Spanish Empire disintegrates from its greatness in the 16th century. The very last straw that broke this empire is the loss of Cuba in 1898. But when the empire as a territory sinks, as a world power sinks, by the way, Spain was defeated by the United States in the case of Cuba, so you see who is coming up and who is going down. The, what started to happen is what I call the beginning of the cultural empire. They say, okay, we don't have territories, but we have a tremendous heritage that we can capitalize on it and create an, 
uh, how can I say, a self-image of importance, of imperial importance without territories. And part of this project is to re-enter the Jews into Spanish history by researching them, by collecting their materials, by approaching Judeo-Spanish speaking Jews in the Ottoman Empire and uh, creating this new bond saying Nostra culpa, that is to say, we seen it was a big mistake of uh, kicking the Jews out of Spain. Theory started to develop that actually the empire fell because it kicked the Jews out. The, the, the brains, the, the financial power of the Jews, we gave them that to the Ottoman Sultan. He became a huge empire and we were down the drain. So these are theories that appeared in the Spanish literature. A huge amount of books about the history of the Jews in Spain in Spanish start to appear appeared in the late 19th uh, uh, century. If you want, this is a vision of the student in the in the Spanish Christian vein. So Menendez Pidal wants to include in his big collection of all Spanish romances. Romances are the old ballads of Spain that are the quintessential. Uh, uh, essence of Spanish literature starting in the medieval period, he wants to get the versions of the Jews. The fact that the Jews continue to speak Spanish, Judeo-Spanish in their own version, but it's Spanish, 500 or 400 years in, the, uh, in this period, 400 years after we throw them away, they still keep our language. You know, psychologically, that makes a huge impression, this new rediscovery of the faithfulness of the Jews to Spanish culture in spite of all what was done to them. So he wants songs, and what's that he do? He has a friend, this is one of Spain's most important composers, Manuel Manrique de Lara. Thanks to the internet, we have now these beautiful archival pictures. You know, I knew all these people, I never seen the pictures. It's only in the past two decades that we can have access to it. So he's, he retires from the army, he is a captain in the in the navy of Spain, and he sends him to the Mediterranean, to the Eastern Mediterranean, to collect songs. And this man goes from Sarajevo to Saloniki to Constantinople to Izmir to Jerusalem, and in every place he stays in very good hotels. They have good budget, and he writes songs in the paper letter head of the hotels on the back. <laughs> He writes songs with the music notation and the text, and all these materials are today in the archive in Madrid. So this is how we have the earliest collections. And let me uh, give you this. This is Jerusalem around the period where Manrique de Lara was there. This is how uh, Jerusalem Sephardic family looked like. And this is one of his letters uh, from the archive in Madrid, and he collected uh, uh, in uh, 1911, uh, okay, uh, one of the versions from this lady who is 84 years old. So she was born in 1827. So we know that in the memory of this woman, we have our song, certainly from the period where she learned it, 1840s. So here we start having evidence that takes the song in its Judeo-Spanish form a uh, very uh, uh, backwards uh, on time. The song is basically exactly the same song as it will be recorded later on. Another important person in Spain, uh, I hope that now you can see also the ecology of human beings that I, I, I have to uh, elaborate in my research, Spanish intellectuals, Turkish Jewish composers, and you will see a couple of more of, of these people, how they are all connected through one song. So my other theoret theoretical postulate is that the song has a certain agency. It has like a certain, how do you say, humanity to itself. Because people gravitate to the song. They act upon the song. They exchange the song. They write the song. They publish the song. They perform the song. And the song, therefore, has a certain agency in, the, in this network. So this is one of the best Friends of the Jews. This is the first 
uh, he's a, sen a senator in the Spanish parliament, he's one of the first to put the motion not only to return the Jews to Spain, but to give them citizenship, something that happens only five years ago when Spain and Portugal decided to give citizenship to any Jew who can prove that the family came from Spain. Do you know what? If some of you have some relatives, Sephardic, etc., you can prove you can get Portuguese citizenship uh, after a very simple exam. So he proposed this already in 1902, 1903. He toured the Ottoman Empire, uh, making bridges uh, with Jews, and the Jews used to send him uh, letters. And he wrote this very important book, Españoles sin patria y la raza sefaradí, that is to say, Spaniards without homeland, and the Sephardic race. Now, the use of the word race, as we know today, we don't sympathize this word, but this is 1902, this is Spanish, and what, it be, what he means is the Sephardic ethnicity, in a way, and not race as we understand that in the post-Holocaust period. One of his friends is this guy, Moises Fresco, and Mr. Fresco is the director of the Alliance School in Istanbul. The Alliance School is the modernizing uh, network of schools sponsored by the French Jewish community to civilize the Sephardic Jews in the Eastern Mediterranean, to teach them uh, new crafts, to teach them French, the language of, uh, of, of global culture at the time. And uh, so you can see here the picture of the, uh, of the school uh, of the uh, Alliance in Istanbul around 1910. And Mr. Pulido Fernandez, in this big book about Spaniards without uh, a homeland, he publishes all the letters that he gets from all these Sephardic Jews around the Mediterranean. And one of the letters that Mr. Fresco sent to him, he says, and I will translate for you, I can see a woman uh, 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 sewing next to her window and rocking uh, her baby. And she is singing. Durmete mi blanca niña, durmete mi blanca for go to sleep, my white uh, 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 girl, uh, my white flower. Or she also sings this one, which is very popular. Abridme galanica que ya amanecer, que vos lindo, abro mi lindo amor. This is our song, exactly in the same formula. It was very, very famous. So we see that Sephardic women around 1904, they are rocking their baby singing this song which is, uh, per I find this particularly interesting, <coughs> one of the reasons that the song uh, and this type of serial songs work very good as lullaby is that they are so repetitive that they can put the baby to sleep. However, the rabbis, and I can give you quotations of rabbis, fascinating quotations, uh, particularly of books of Musar, of, of, uh, of uh, moral, moralistic from the 18th century, they are so mad at their women that they sing these songs to their babies and they are poisoning them from their milk. That's one of the rabbis, uh, the Rabbi Shevet Musar. He writes his, uh, his uh, how do you say, uh, really uh, mad at the women that are singing this song. Now, going very fast uh, on the last 10 minutes that I have, Menendez Pidal comes to Jerusalem in 1970. 1964. He is 90 years old, the man in the middle. And he's coming to Israel in 1964, still during the peak of the Franco era, shows the degree of the, of the uh, emotional involvement of this man with the Jewish people. He's so admiring of Israel coming back, the Jews, the Jewish people coming back to life. And he is met by two individuals which are extremely important for the history of the Sephardic song, Moshe Atias and Isaac Levy. Moshe Atias was a, a, a teacher in Jerusalem, basically a clerk of the Jerusalem municipality, and he does all his research on his own spare time. After he comes back from work, he goes to the old ladies in Jerusalem to write the songs, and he published two very important books on the Sephardic song. Isaac Levy is a man from the Israeli radio. He's a baritone, he's a singer, but he is also extremely committed to, uh, to uh, the Ladino culture, Ladino language. 
He published 10 volumes of Sephardic Hazanut, 10 volumes of music notation, and four volumes of Sephardic songs in Ladino. His volumes in Ladino, the first one published in 1957 in London, are the source for much of the Ladino revival that the first example I played for you has to do. So here you see what we have is a sort of research, not academic, but done by what I call cultural agents of the community. The community is changing, is fading, the Judeo-Spanish language is disappearing, but collecting the songs is an act of, in a way, having a last minute hold on this culture. But the moment the songs are in the market, they have their agency and others, including non-Jews, love the songs and they start to, to, to record them uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Israel and outside of Israel too. Here is one of the versions by, by, by Atias, but what is important is the context that he says for this song, because this is really the original context. There were Menagnot. Menagnot is uh, not the women who play instruments, as we would translate in modern Hebrew, but the women who sing. And there used to be women singers in Salonika, one of the most important Jewish communities uh, in the Ottoman Empire, that used to sing songs to the bride in the different stages of the wedding. And this song was sung okay, at the beginning uh, uh, of the day after the wedding. These old women come to the, where the bride is sleeping with the groom, and they sing this song, Abridne Galanika Kiyaba Amanisi. And obviously, the, the uh, central content of the song becomes uh, very clear what is the connection between the song and, uh, and the, the context of performance. Here you have a nice picture of how these women look in Salonika in the late 19th century, this is from a postcard. Uh, and uh, they used to be sort of semi-professional uh, uh, singers. Uh, many of the, uh, of the versions that are published, uh, like this one uh, published in Paris in the 19, uh, uh, in late 1950s, has variants, OK? So here, for example, the mother is baking. She's baking in the middle of the night. So she decides just take her take from her the, the baking tool, and she will go to sleep. So we have many variants uh, of the song. And this one, which is very unique, has a happy ending, which no other versions have. Toda la noche, toda te estuve esperando con las puertas abiertas, serios, alumbrando. I was waiting for you all night with the open doors and with all the candles uh, uh, light, and, 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 and lighted. So she says, uh, 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 tell me, my beautiful bride, when I'm going to go with you, kiss her, hug her, and take her with you. That's it. So now here we have uh, the ending to that scene that in all the other versions remains open. Did she really open the door or did she not? We will leave musicology now. And I want to play a couple of more examples so that you know what I'm talking about. This record published in New York City, Sephardic folk songs, sung by Gloria Levy, 1958, is a landmark in the modern resuscitation of the Sephardic song. Madame uh, Levy, who is still around with us, that's the way she looked in 1958, she is, uh, um, she's not a professional singer. Her mother, Emily Levy, whom I had the privilege of met at the Jewish Theological Seminary some 30 years ago, I brought her for a class of mine for an interview. She was an amazing folk singer of Sephardic songs in New York. She was from Turkey. And uh, she was offered in 1958 to record this record after uh, um, another Jew, who is also a very interesting uh, story, Moshe Ash. This Moshe Ash founded the Folk Ways Record, a real um, uh, uh, pioneer, world pioneer, in the recording of world music, when the term world music didn't exist. So he recorded these amazing records. Every anthrop American anthropologist that went to the most uh, uh, faraway lands, he asked them, can you record 
also music, even if you're not a musicologist, and he published this record. So he heard Madame Levy, and she, he offered her to produce this record of Sephardic songs. And Emily was a very humble lady. She says, I am too old to sing for a record. Better my young daughter, she will record it. Emily was at the time 43 years old, but she was too old to record. So uh, Gloria uh, recorded. Gloria is already American born, so she has a little bit of accent in her Ladino. And let's listen to the song. They went to the studio with a guitarist, uh, a, a, a Spanish guitarist from New York City. They didn't have any rehearsal. They just improvised the accompaniment in, in the play. So let's listen to this this performance. Mm -hmm. So the record is in the market and it reaches Spain. And in Spain, Joaquin Diaz, the dean of the modern Spanish folklore, uh, he is more or less the Woody Woodry of Spain. <laughs> he hears this recording and he is fascinating. And he records his own versions of almost the same song. So now you see how the songs start to enter the Spanish market non-Jewish market on the wings of one single LP published in New York City. La noche con un duro pensando So the song doesn't have a refrain like a pop song has to have. So he invented the refrain. La, 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 la. This is his own invention. But of course, the moment his song is in the market, then these gestures are going to be reproduced. So you, it creates what I call an electronic tradition. So we have an oral tradition, we have a written tradition, and we have an electronic tradition. And I can tell you every singer in the world singing in Ladino from where they are stealing, stealing the, the, the versions, because sometimes they reproduce even mistakes in Judeo-Spanish. So that mistake I heard from an, that other singer. So, Joaquin Diaz is still, uh, we had the, the great honor of being with him uh, uh, last fall with my wife in Spain. He's still well and alive and very active in the Center for Documentation of Spanish Music that he, um, he created. So this is how the first video came into being. They are imitating Joaquin Diaz. They are not imitating the Jews, but they are going by this chain of transmission getting to the Spanish TV. So YouTube, uh, I searched uh, a few months ago, there are 2,090, uh, um, so, but of course there are many duplicates. So there are at least 62 different versions of the song in YouTube, performed by artists from five continents, including Japan. So I brought you two or three as much as we have time. I can spend with you the whole afternoon because the performances tell a lot about how the public imagination reimagines
the Sephardic Jews through this song. So now we know a lot about this song, where it comes from, what is the framework of its original performance. But now the song is totally detached from its origins, from its original context of performance in the Sephardic community. It has a life of its own as an object in cyberspace. So this is uh, um, uh, one of the medieval uh, performances. So many Sephardic songs are performed as medieval songs, usually by using French instruments, but never mind. Who cares? <laughs> the medieval period allows us for a wide range of interpretation. So this is. Uh, And of course, the video, the visuals are important. This is the Jewish Museum of Toledo. So this is one of the icons of uh, medieval Sephardic presence in Spain that still remains uh, in Toledo. And of course, illuminated uh, Hebrew manuscripts are also a nice source. This is a performance um, of a church in a church in Toledo. So here we have our song, whose context you already know, being sung almost like a sacred song. They understand the text, so the part of the boy is sung by the soloist, and the girls uh, <coughs> respond in the name of the girl. Uh, some of the performances are wild. Here you have a medieval group in, a, in Hungary, in tra northern Transylvania, that is a place I haven't seen many Sephardic Jews, uh, and, uh, and they accompany this with a dance. They are called, so the, the song becomes also a dance. And the dance is amazing because here you have uh, what these people in northern Transylvania think are quintessential Jewish movements in dance. And I think it's hilarious if you ever seen Hasidic dance, so you will be able to recognize. <laughs> Etc. <laughs> uh, so Jews are Jews. Who cares? If I Jews, say Jews. Jews are Jews, and, and that's the way Jews move when they dance, no matter what the song. Uh, here uh, now, YouTube also allow us to see the presence of a song in the street uh, without any uh, particular special context except just uh, the context of the street. And this is a type of ethnography that will be inconceivable without YouTube. How can I know how the song is used in a street situation? So just a few. Uh,
So what is important for me from the ethnographic point of view is that he's also reading a score. So he's not even memorizing the song. He's singing from one of the versions that are published, perhaps one of them by me. So you see <laughs> that also academic research become a resource for the use of artists. It's the academia is not outside the circuit of culture, but is part that nurtures that. And I cannot count the amount of singers from all around the world who had come to me in Jerusalem asking, Professor, can we have new Sephardic songs to perform? So, and I fully participate by helping them. Why not? Here you have an Indian dancing. Mm And our last example to end, uh, because it's never ending, you saw 2,090 versions. Uh, it's interesting now that the people from Galicia in Spain, not the Galicianers of, of, of uh, Poland, but the, the Galicians, they say, this is our song. <laughs> this is our song. And here you have one of the best folk rock bands ensembles of Galicia in an album of Celtic music. Now, the Galicians imagine themselves as part of the Celtic people, the original people of Spain, before all these uh, Arab invasions and Muslims and all the people who came from the south. We are northern people, okay? So they have their performance. And uh, I will show you uh, two videos and uh, performing folk rock uh, stuff. Celtic music. I won't go now into musicological observations, but there is a very interesting switch in this version towards a form of modality that is more identified with medieval music rather than the Sephardic versions. And the Celtic people of northern Spain, they also have their own dance. And here is the dance performance. <laughs>
Well, I think we could, we should stop here. We have a shopping center in Sao Paulo in Brazil, a wild performance danced by children, by teenagers. But I think I'll stop here. If you have a few questions, I would love to, to answer them. But this is just a very short uh, chapter in this a very, very long story. A book, My Mind, is going to be published in Madrid in a few months that includes seven studies of seven different Sephardic songs in this style. Each one is about 40 pages long. And it gives a totally new vision of what Sephardic culture is and was. So this is how songs can tell us a lot about history that texts, real texts, cannot give us. Uh, so this is what I see as the major contribution of this approach. Thank you very much. Yeah. Don't miss the class because of me, please. <laughs> so, um, if anyone else wants to stick around for a bit to speak with Professor Spruzzi or have a little more food, that would be great. Um, but thank you again for coming, and we'll see you next spring in four minutes. So. Thank you very much. Thank you.